Hi, this is a presentation on collaborative corpus work at a distance, building a remote workflow around YouTube. My name is Alexander Rice, and my co-presenter and community collaborator, Belhika Dagwa, was uh, unfortunately not available for the recording phase of this presentation. She had to travel to her remote home community to attend to some pressing matters there. But before getting started, I just want to make sure her contribution to this project is recognized even though we weren't able to record her portion of it. Uh, this workflow is our way to continue doing our corpus work despite all of the travel restrictions imposed by the current global pandemic. I'm in North America, Belhika is in South America. Uh, we do it all remotely and it works and it does what we need it to do. Uh, so we would like to share how we do it. Um, perhaps it can be useful for some of you who may be in the same sort of context and situation that we are in. So here's a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today. Before going through the workflow, I'm going to describe the context in which this workflow works and some of the pros and cons of it that ought to be considered before deciding if this workflow may or may not be suitable for your situation. Then I'll go through the workflow it, or itself and talk about some details of some of the particulars and then we'll just wrap up at the end here. Uh, so, the context. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, I was using um, Ryan Pennington's uh, Seymour Flex Elon Corpus workflow. And so here's just a brief overview of how that works. So you have your recordings, right? You put them into your corpus, uh, and Seymour is a great corpus management tool. You can also do transcription and translation in there. Um, so you do your, you put them in your corpus, you do your transcription, translation in Seymour or Elon. Um, then you et export that as a flex text file to flex and you do your uh, language explorer and you do your annotation in there and then you export and re-import to Elon and that gives you your final product which is a time aligned interlinear text with media transcription translation all ready to go all ready to be archived um, so in 2019 I was in the field uh, with Belhika and this is what we did so I would we would record I put them in the corpus, I'd um, uh, set them up in Elon, and Belhika would do the transcriptions and translations in Elon, and she tried the same more as well. Um, then I took it the rest of the way, uh, through Flex and then to Elon. Uh, so then I went back to Canada um, in the fall, and uh, we applied for some funding to do a larger documentation project in 2020 to get some new recordings and to continue um, transcribing and translating these recordings which we had already collected in 2019. Unfortunately, coronavirus happened and this part, the transcription translation part, became very difficult, right? Um, so we wanted to still get that previous material transcribed and translated. Belhika was still pretty new at using Seymour and Elon and um, so when we were together it was useful to have uh, me around to do some of the file setup and troubleshooting and whatnot. She also didn't have her own computer to use Seymour and Elon independently, so what to do? Um, so luckily, we have a mutual friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Todd Swanson, an anthropologist at Arizona State University. He's been doing linguistic anthropology and documentation in Ecuador for a long time now. He runs a very neat field school in Ecuador for researchers and indigenous language speakers of the area to work together in the same space on multidisciplinary projects. So Belhik and I were at this place in 2019 and that's where we were working on our very small documentation project. Um, so for several years now uh, Swanson puts some of the videos that he records on a channel in YouTube so that people such as researchers or even people in the local communities who have in low access to internet uh, can view uh, these videos, right? And he's trained some of the local community members how to transcribe and translate them using YouTube's transcription and translation platform. Um, so we thought, well, maybe we could do that. The question was, is how do we shove YouTube into this workflow? We don't just want videos with transcriptions and translations. We still want the final time-aligned interlinear text and media. So we found a way to jam YouTube into this workflow and use it as the primary means of transcription and translation. So I'm just going to tell you how we did that. 
Um, but first, uh, let's talk. Let's continue to talk a little bit about the context in which this works. Um, so, the language we're working on is Northern Pastasa Quechua, a variety of Amazonian Quechua, which is a Quechuan language spoken in Ecuador. And due to the development of petroleum extraction infrastructure in the region, there are now some cities and large towns there. Many speakers move out of their rainforest communities and into the more urbanized areas to find work. Um, there's a lot of migration. Um, this map on the right here kind of represents that. In this red area, um, there's um, uh, the red area has more infrastructure like paved roads, electricity, indoor plumbing, and internet. Um, not everywhere, but you're more likely to find those things in the red area compared to the other areas. Um, the yellow area has roads and maybe some electricity, and the green area is still very much rainforest without a lot of infrastructure. And you only really can get around by river or air. So uh, Belhika lives in this red area near one of these urban centers. And while she does not have her own personal computer, she does have access to these. Um, I don't know what you call these kinds of places in English, maybe an internet cafe without the cafe part. Um, in Ecuador, they call them cabinas or uh, cyber. And they're basically just little local businesses in which you can pay like uh, $1 US an hour to use a desktop computer with internet. Uh, these things are all over Ecuador. And it's a pretty essential service um, for people that don't have their own computers and need to do things like sending emails and printing documents. Um, in the US and Canada, for example, uh, this niche is kind of fulfilled filled by um, public libraries. But in Ecuador, there are these little uh, businesses here. Um, so because these are public machines that will be used by multiple people, we don't want to be downloading and storing files on them, right? Uh, first, because of pri the privacy right of the consultants in the videos um, that we are transcribing and translating. And secondly, because, you know, if we store them in these computers, someone just may delete them. So in this situation, if this is the technology we have to work with, YouTube is probably the best way um, to transcribe and translate in this situation. Um, all, all the transcriber translator has to do is get on these computers, log into YouTube, do their work in there, transcribe, translate, just save their session when they're done, and then just log out. And that's pretty much all they need to do. Um, so this is great for, um, you know, if your transcribers and translators live near or, you know, or in an urban area with access to places like this and internet and it can be great for you know uh, if you don't have a lot of budget for you to get laptops for everyone um, uh, and of course obviously before attempting this you want to make sure you obviously have a secure way to send money to the team members who are going to be paid for their uh, transcription and translation work we have found that Western Union is the one that works best for us in this uh, region here Okay, and uh, here is a quick glance at what the YouTube transcription translation interface looks like. Uh, the video is over here. Um, the waveform where you place your segments is down here. Uh, you enter the text in up here. It's pretty simple and straightforward, certainly more so than Elon, but there's a trade-off. Uh, using YouTube is easier, but there's less that it can do. So let's talk about that. So here's a list of pros and cons using YouTube over Saymor and Elon. Um, like I said, uh, YouTube, it's very easy to use. There's no need to upload or download or store large files. There's no need to package them together or do any of that kind of setup like you have to do in Elon, you know, with the tiers and all of that. Um, there's also less of a malware risk. You know, you could, you could use public computers like these like we just saw, and if you wanted to, sure, you could install Elon or Saymore on a flash drive, keep your media files on that flash drive, and then just plug it in to those public computers and work on them and, you know, um, pull it out, you know, when you're done. But that inc incurs risk of getting malware on your flash drive. That's not going to happen with just YouTube. As long as you remember to log out at the end of your session, there's not going to be any, there's very little risk that's going to uh, happen here. 
Um, and this is okay. And then this, uh, this other thing is uh, neat here. Um, uh, another team member or researcher, whoever, can monitor progress of the transcriber translator remotely. So, for example, after um, Belhika finishes a session, I can just log into YouTube from my end up here in Canada, and I can look at what she has done for the day. Um, and if, given that the consultants and community is okay with this, another great point is that you could pretty much instantly make these videos public, uh, publicly viewable on YouTube, and they can be immediately available to the community if they have internet access. So those are some pros. Uh, there are some cons. Um, since YouTube works with video files, you cannot work directly with an audio file such as a WAV file. So if the audio track in the video file is a bit messy and for whatever reason you need to transcribe using the WAV file, YouTube is not going to be the best way to go. Um, also, segmenting intonational units in YouTube is not very precise. Certainly not compared to Seymour or Elon. You have to kind of click and drag segment boundaries around to get to get the segments to start and stop exactly where you want. Um, so it's a bit difficult to get that near pinpoint accuracy for segment boundaries that you can with Elon or Seymour. Um, there is something you can do to mitigate this, and I will address that later. Um, importantly, uh, the way, also important, is the way that YouTube sets up its tiers, if you want to call them that. Um, because of that, YouTube does not let you transcribe multiple speakers in a single video very well at all. There's only one transcription tier, and it won't let you have more than one. Uh, there is a workaround for this, which I'll address later, but the point for now is just that YouTube is not ideal for if you want to transcribe a video that has multiple, if you want to transcribe multiple speakers in a single video. Um, finally, um, obviously, the transcriber translator needs a computer or a laptop or a Chromebook or whatever, and internet access. The mobile version of YouTube, like on a smartphone, does not currently support the transcription translation platform. So if your transcriber or a translator doesn't have access to either of these things, then this workflow will not be very helpful for you, um, which unfortunately is the case uh, for many um, communities, right? They're often very far away from internet or electricity sometimes, and this will not be helpful for that kind of situation. At this point, you may be thinking, well, if they have access to a laptop and internet, why can't they just use Elon or Seymour? And um, what I have to say to that, that is in this context, that while access to a personal computer wasn't available, again, there was access to public computers. Further, downloading, another reason is um, downloading large video files requires um, a certain amount of bandwidth, right? More, I think, than just you know streaming a video on YouTube or using the transcription translation in YouTube. And as I said er previously, using YouTube just makes things easier for the transcriber and translator, especially if they're new or inexperienced. You know, they could be intimidated by Elon or Se Seymour. I certainly was intimidated the first time I ever tried to do anything in Elon. I think we've all been there. And you know maybe you can't you maybe you don't have enough funding to get laptops to people, um, but maybe again if the, if there is some computers nearby that are publicly available, um, it may be cheaper to just um, you know to cover that cost for them to use those computers than it would be to um, um, you know just um, purchase some laptops. The point here is that this workflow does not work for every situation. It can work for situations similar to ours, and that's why I've taken the time to describe the context of our situation. If yours is similar, this could be useful for you. If it's not, then it probably won't be useful for you. Okay, so let's talk about the workflow itself. So 20 minutes is not enough time to go over the whole thing in detail, step by step. So I'm just going to go over it in broad strokes here. I am working on a step by step guide and a video tutorial of how to do this and those will hopefully be appearing soon. Um, but in the meantime, let's just uh, look at this um, uh, very generally. So we made these cute little emoji representations of ourselves over here. So uh, here's me up in Canada, and here's Belhica down in Ecuador. Um, and this line is kind of the travel restriction barrier, I guess. So uh, the first thing that happens is that I choose the video files that we want to transcribe and translate, yank them out of the corpus, 
then I upload them to a YouTube channel that I've already set up and I've given access to Belhika to it so she can log into it and then do her transcription and translation there. Uh, when she does that, um, this produces what are called uh, subtitle files. And she can either send those to me, just export them from YouTube and send, send them to me, or I can just you know go into YouTube and just get them myself. Um, then I can set up the Elon file with the media and just import the transcription and translation SRT files. And I can you know make those as the transcription and translation tiers, respectively. Um, and so, and this is uh, the review revise stage. So, I prefer to review uh, the the transcription translations in Elon. You know, checking the segmentation, the use of the orthography, or whatever. Um, but you know, there are different ways you could do this. Um, you or whoever it is that's doing the review um, can just do this in YouTube. You know, they finish in YouTube. You can just go look at it there. Um, if I do it in Elon and I want to make a few edits, but if I want her to, um, you know, revise something or go look at it, I could just export new subtitle files from Elon. Elon does that now, and I could just put them into YouTube and just overwrite the previous um, subtitle files. Um, we could also get together on a conference call, um, one of us sharing our screens, and we could just go through the transcription translation together. There's different ways you could do this review revise part. Uh, when we're both satisfied with the transcription and translation, I then proceed with Pennington's workflow, export the file to Flex, doing the annotation, and then um, exporting it to Elon again to get the final product. A time-aligned interlinear text with media, all nice and ready to be archived, and it should look something like this. Um, it's very nice. Um, so, and that's the workflow overall. It's not, it's, again, it's not very revolutionary here. It's just um, uh, tweaking something to make it work. Anyway, um, here I just want to make a quick note about conference calls and screen sharing in the review revise process. We have found that Zoom is the best overall for screen sharing when going over the transcription and translation in video. If you want to share your screen and play video and audio in the shared screen, Zoom is the best way to do that. Um, these other ones, there are different pros and cons. Some are more optimized for sharing things in YouTube. Um, others are not. So you can go over this slide yourself. But Zoom is the, um, uh, the best overall. All right, so before wrapping up here, um, I wanted to uh, quickly talk about those workarounds to obstacles that I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, YouTube is overall not as powerful as Elon when it comes to transcribing and translating, but if you're willing to put some extra work into it, you can kind of get around some of those obstacles using YouTube. So first I mentioned that s segmenting intonational units is less precise in YouTube. To get around this, you or another team member who is more experienced with transcribing uh, and Elon in general can do the segmentation of the intonational units in Elon, or say more, and just export that as a, as a blank sort of subtitle file. And then you can just put that into the video that's been uploaded to YouTube. That way the transcriber doesn't have to do any segmentation. They can just go through the segments, intonational units that have already been demarcated there, and then just type in what they hear. And obviously they can edit the the segments, um, the duration, or how many there are um, in there, YouTube, if they if they like to. Um, so we did this is we did this when we got started. Um, I Belhika was still new at the whole transcription thing, so I would do the segment segmentation of the international units in Elon, um, export these the, the, as a sort of a blank transcription, upload that to YouTube, and she would go through it and put in her transcription. Now that she's uh, a lot more experienced at this, she does the segmentation by herself in YouTube now. The other big obstacle was multi-speaker videos. Since YouTube lets you only have one transcription tier, the way to get around this is to simply transcribe and translate one speaker, export and save those subtitle files, then erase them from YouTube, and then transcribe 
transcribe and translate the second speaker. Export and save those subtitle files and so on and so forth until you've gone through however many speakers there are that you want to transcribe and translate in the video. Then you just uh, slap it all together into an Elon file. It takes a long time, but it works. And we've only done one multi-speaker video so far. It does indeed take a long time, but it worked fine, just fine. Um, so that's it. Uh, what I tried to show here today was how we adapted Ryan Pennington's corpus workflow to the situation of the pandemic by incorporating YouTube as the main transcription translation tool. It will not work for all situations or contexts, but it will probably work for ones like ours that meet those contextual circumstances that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think this is important, uh, not just for the purpose of getting corpus work done, despite all of these uh, travel restrictions imposed by the global pandemic, but also because it may be a few years still before we're able to get back and work together again in the same place, you know, outside researchers, in-country researchers and community members. I think it's important that we do the best we can to maintain those kinds of relationships within a you know, a collaborative documentation team. Um, it's important to maintain those relationships and um, also very important is that we can continue capacity building, right? Community team members can potentially still work on developing these skills and getting paid to do so despite, uh, you know, the pandemic. Um, especially for people living in economically depressed areas, having a job, even, you know, these short temporary jobs like translating and transcribing stuff can be extremely valuable given, given that, you know, jobs in general worldwide are more scarce than usual. Um, yep, so that's everything. Um, as I mentioned previously, I am writing a very, uh, very detailed step-by-step -step guide of how to do this workflow in a video tutorial. It'll be available soon-ish. In the meantime, though, you can contact me if you would like to, uh, you know, start working on this, um, trying out this out immediately. I'd be, and I, I'd also be happy to receive any suggestions for improvements to this or questions. Um, so that is all I have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.